Ladies and gentlemen, people of the internet, welcome back to yet another episode of Crypto Over Coffee. I hope you're doing well. If you're new here, every single Friday, I break down the latest news and hottest topics in the world of technology and cryptocurrency whilst drinking a delicious cup of coffee. And today we have a healthy, dare I say hefty, serving of Bitcoin related things to talk about, along with Chainlink, EOS, EOS, Cardano, and much more. So stick around to the end of the episode so you don't miss out on all that good stuff. But like we do on this show every single week, let's kick it off with questions from the community on YouTube and Twitter. So I'll head over to the good old iPad and get started with those. Now, as always, if you do want to get one of your questions answered, leave them in the comments down below or tweet me at Ashoshi4. And if you would be so inclined, please hit that subscribe button right now and subscribe to the channel. And you can hit that little bell notification button too so you can get a heads up whenever I post new content on the interwebs. Let's get into the questions. So the first question I wanted to address here is one that I've gotten comments on a ton over the last six months to a year. And this one in particular is from Asian Miracle. I have a programming question. What is the best free website to learn JavaScript, Python, and C++ slash C Sharp? Now, this is a great question and I wanna answer this first and foremost because people are all quarantined at home, people have some time on their hands or people might need to pivot their careers at this moment in time. And the truth is anyone in the world can program. It doesn't take a special brain to program. You don't have to be good at math to program. These are all myths that are given to people that make you not wanna try. I urge you to try and here's how to get started. I've set up a guide of sorts and I've been helping people individually, but I'm gonna formalize this into a video soon. But here's a little bit of a sneak peek into that. If you wanna to learn to program, I recommend you start on Skillshare. I'm gonna leave a link down below for you to get a free trial. That's two months worth, I think, of free Skillshare content. What Skillshare is, is it's basically a website where there are online courses built to help you learn programming, web design, uh, digital design, all sorts of things. You can learn a ton of stuff on Skillshare, but there are some great programming courses on there. I recommend you get started with, first, if you have zero programming experience, I'll link up the course specifics here on the screen or down below as well. There's a beginner, like basics of programming, so you can understand the concepts. That's the first place to start. And you're gonna go up to like lesson 20 or 21 in that course. Then you're gonna split off and you're gonna go to one of the two specific courses for programming language. So if you wanna go JavaScript, go JavaScript, that's fine. That's great for web apps. That's great for things you can build and really see and use. I will say though, Python is great because Python's very much a data science oriented language. There are a lot of things you can do with Python as well, but maybe not things that you can quickly see and interact with and play with in the same way that JavaScript is. So pick one of the two, they're both great, but stick with that. Once you choose one, stick with it, learn it, and start to master it, right? So I'll leave links down in the description below as well for my picks, my top picks for JavaScript and Python courses on Skillshare. So if you sign up for Skillshare, you're gonna get two free months to basically be at home. People are working from home, people are hanging out at home, learn this stuff, spend a, an hour or two a day just devoting to learning a new skill, and you can do this completely for free. Great place to start. Then if you wanna take it to the next level, my advice to you would be to go and check out something like Treehouse. So Treehouse is a website designed to sort of bring you to a coding bootcamp of sorts. It's an online course site as well, but it's really there to sort of give you a digital degree in programming. Now, I love Treehouse because Treehouse really goes deeper and brings you way past the point where you will get on Skillshare, but it does obviously cost something. So once you've found, hey, I actually can program, I know what I'm doing, I'm passionate about it, jump onto Treehouse and give it a shot. I really think that it's worth it and uh, the Treehouse people are very nice. You can talk to them on Twitter, you can reach out to support. They're great and super helpful if you get stuck. So definitely check out my link in the description below for that as well. And I urge you guys to try programming. If you have questions, reach out to me. I'd love to help you anytime. Thank you for the question, Asian Miracle, and best of luck in your programming journey, everyone. All right, The Thinker asks, I don't like CZ's move, and I didn't like Justin's move with Steam either. Thanks to the community, they forked, and now they're kicking the, yeah, kicking butt, I guess. It's time to switch from coin market cap to market checkup, question mark. Yeah, 
Probably. I think coin market cap being acquired by Binance is probably not great for the unbiased nature of the website. Obviously, that's remains to be seen and no one can be sure, but I don't really use coin micro cap anyway. I use plenty of other websites out there. Uh, I'm not familiar with market checkup, but definitely reasonable. I think coin gecko is one a lot of people use. Uh, question also, what's your opinion regarding tether minting 1.5 billion tether and this BTC spike last Sunday related to quantitative easing uh, on the tether situation? In my opinion, there's no difference between what Tether's doing and what the central banks are doing in printing money because we have absolutely no traceability into what's going on with Tether. So I have no idea what's going on there. And the BTC spike related to quantitative easing, I think people are reacting to what's going on in the world. And Bitcoin is factored into the world of safe haven assets in some form or fashion. So we will see what actually happens with Bitcoin as this whole thing continues to unfold. But Seems like good news right now. Hard to say though. CC asks, hey man, I forgot to ask something. Did you try to build on Cardano or did you check out their code and stuff? Hope you're not biased since you're an ambassador, but how do you think about their code? I don't mind delays, but I think they might get into trouble for adoption if they release, after they release, if they do release. Okay, there's a lot to unpack here. So yes, I've tried to build on Cardano. The truth is I don't know Haskell, the main programming language you need to develop things with Plutus and Cardano. So I've been trying to learn that, but between this channel, my full-time job, and all the other things I've got to do in just normal adult life, I haven't had a lot of time to learn a new language you know, on the side. Uh, so that's delayed me quite a bit, but I still am working on it. And in terms of their code, there's a lot of code there. And so I haven't sat and done a full code review because that's something that even if I were paid to do, it would take me ages and ages and ages to do it. And I don't even think I'm qualified to review these really smart people's code and give them you know, critical feedback. However, as an ambassador, my role is not to just hype up Cardano and I'm also not paid. So this is just something I volunteered to do. I like the project, I love the project. And I think the way they're going about it is correct. And I think the way that they designed it like an academic project almost means that their code is going to be cleaner and their actual vision is going to be what gets deployed rather than halfway there and then they'll try and fork it later. So I do support Cardano. I think it's of quality, but I think if they don't get Gogan and Shelly out there in the world, out there in the world before Ethereum 2.0 hits phase one, which I guess is the beginning of 2021, then they're going to have some issues. So that's just my honest opinion. Thank you for your question. Ron Swartz asks, so what happens when all the Bitcoins are mined? Specifically, what will secure the network at that time? I love this question. This question's fantastic. So I have a few theories and my main theory is this. There is, as we know, a Satoshi wallet, right? A Satoshi wallet that has an exorbitant amount of Bitcoins. Like when we're talking exorbitant, I mean a ton. And I believe personally that that Satoshi wallet has been set aside purposefully for the day when the last Bitcoin is mined. And we're years and years, years and years away from that. I think well over a hundred years away from that. But when that happens, Bitcoin's value could be who knows what, God knows what, high or low, who knows. But I believe that that wallet was set aside for that Bitcoin to be used as a central treasury to pay out rewards potentially. It's a theory. I think it would make sense because that amount of Bitcoin could be used to extend and continue to secure the network in terms of rewards and keeping the incentives going for miners indefinitely based on what it could be worth in the future. I think that's one. Two, if Bitcoin's value continues to increase as exponentially as it has, then there is nothing that says transaction fees couldn't sustain miners as long as the network's overall hash rate and the cost of compute resources continues to stay sort of stable in its growth as well. I think that the network's hash rate might not continue to grow at the crazy range and levels that we've seen, and we can never predict what changes are going to be made to consensus, if ever. But I think transaction fees could also be enough to start securing the network in the future as well. So between the Satoshi wallet being a potential treasury to pay out incentives and the transaction fees, I think there's enough there to secure the Bitcoin network, even without this block reward 
in there as a, a standalone reward. And I think that was the design from the beginning. But my guess is about as, as good as yours. I don't know, but thank you for the question. AnonVPN asks, BTC is 99% speculative, the smartest gambling asset ever created. If it should reach 50 or 100K, why would anyone spend it on a cup of coffee? Genuinely asking. This was in response, I think, to my last crypto over coffee where I was talking about spending Bitcoin and I asked you if you had spent Bitcoin in the past. So the reason why people spend Bitcoin, I think, is because A, I think Bitcoin was really intended to be used as a means of payment in the first place. And I think people use that that way. But for me in the past, there was there were a couple of months where I had Bitcoin using crypto.com, their debit card. I had Bitcoin and I was living off of that Bitcoin for two months. Like I didn't touch any money in a bank account. I was using my, my Bitcoin for a couple of months and just living off of that. And I was doing that really just for experimentation purposes. I wanted to see if I could only live off of this one you know, stack of crypto that I had and just to see what it would be like living with the volatility of crypto as your daily form of payment. But I think it proved that there are services being built around this ecosystem that will make crypto viable as a day-to-day -day payment mechanism. And it could act as like a long-term digital savings account for people that they pull money out of when they need it. So I don't think people would want to spend all their Bitcoin, no, because it's a speculative asset. But I think people do have an appetite for spending it, especially using Lightning as a means of payment if this becomes their main form of payment for a lot of different things. So thank you for your question and on VPN, there's no straight answer, but that's just my opinion. Harvey Voss asks, it's nice to know the face behind these good projects. Very good content as always. I thought Bat Tokens seemed like a good project and I use Brave daily. Couple of questions. Thank you very much for the love on that video. What's the benefit in terms of investing in BAT tokens, BAT, basic attention tokens? My earnings would be better if I kept mine in a uphold, but I'd also like to know if the value of the BAT increases, will the rewards change in amount? Okay, there's a lot here and I'll answer these questions as well. How bullish am I about investing in, in basic attention tokens? So I'm bullish on the use case for basic attention tokens, but I don't think basic attention tokens are structured economically to accrue in value to these crazy numbers. People are saying, oh, BAT to $10 per coin. That doesn't make any sense. That's not what it's intended for. Could it happen? Yes, with mass adoption, it theoretically could happen. But basic attention tokens, the denominations don't matter. It's what you are willing to give another creator or what you're willing to earn as an ad watcher or an ad viewer. And ultimately it's just a means of exchange. I don't think basic attention token is like the biggest part of my portfolio. I'm not going in and dumping my money and investing in basic attention token with my dollars and cents that much. When I receive basic attention tokens, I'm holding on to some because I believe it will accrue in value, but I don't think we're gonna see basic attention token to $100. Okay, I mean, you hear so, so many crazy things out there in terms of what token prices are going to do. I'm bullish on basic attention token and the use case. I'm not saying though that the basic attention token is going to accrue in value so much and you're gonna see this crazy 100X, you know, you have all these altcoin 100X videos. I don't know that it's in that category. Um, would your earnings be better Will the rewards change in amount? That's the other question. The rewards changing in amount, likely the number of base contention tokens you get are still going to be referent, like referred to in US dollars until we get to the point where crypto is a, I guess, a reserve or people think in terms of crypto. So for a long period of time, if base contention token increases in value and an advertiser's agreed to a $5, you know, $5 CPM, you're going to get an equivalent of that in basic attention tokens, which would mean your rewards would be technically less, but the value would be the same. You know what I mean? So the volume of that that you're getting would be less, but you're still getting the same amount. I know that that's a little bit paradoxical, but that's the truth. So I know there's a lot there, but basic attention token and Brave, you know, one of my favorite projects. If you haven't tried Brave and you're watching this video right now, download the browser. It's down in the link in the description below. It's the best browser I've ever used. It's the one that I use every single day. I ditched Chrome. I ditched all the other browsers I used and it's my number one. I do use Firefox still occasionally, but Brave is great. So give it a try. Thanks very much for your question, Harvey. And I think that actually wraps it up for the questions. I actually really need a sip of coffee. 
in my fancy camp mug because all the other ones were dirty. And we're in the middle of like a windstorm, hurricane, crazy thing at my house. My whole house is shaking and there's a bunch of stuff going on outside with like the wind like blasting the window. And my coffee is ice cold because this thing is made of aluminum. So that's a major bummer. Cold coffee within the first like 10 minutes of the video. But anyway, the show must go on. All right, now let's dive into the news for the day. And I wanna start with Chainlink. I have to say, Chainlink is absolutely crushing it right now. With the recent partnerships with interoperability networks, Polkadot, Icon, and Kava within that Cosmos ecosystem, as well as popular interest earning products like Celsius, the price of Link has largely defied all those downward trends that we've seen over the last couple of months. It's looked really, really strong. So my proverbial hat comes off to the Chainlink team and the community because despite what's been going on in the world around us, they keep building, they keep supporting, and the fans have continued to ride or die for the mission and support Chainlink and the Link cryptocurrency. A lot of people didn't ditch it when it went down to, I think it was like in the mid twos or $2 and it went, basically it got cut in half or by 40 some percent. It's no secret that I'm a fan of Chainlink from a tech perspective and I believe that the technology they've developed is unique and really powerful. So within the world of smart contracts, one of the singular biggest challenges is developing reliable, unmalleable, conditional logic that controls potentially millions of dollars of value, if not more. And a critical part of making that possible, especially for real world use cases, is using real data from outside the scope of the blockchain and outside the scope of the contract. And that's what Chainlink is about. That's what it delivers. They're doing things the right way. They're building quality. They're building a great marketing team. They're marketing it right. And they're positioning their technology to be one of the most widely used versions of the data oracle. They're not the only one, but they're doing the right thing to put it in the hands of more users and to make it easy for protocols to adopt. That's the key. It's really, really impressive stuff. And I'm eager to see the advent of staking and service level agreements in wide use within the Chainlink ecosystem. So I was very happy last week to hear all the positive feedback about the new segment, 404 Logic Not Found, that I debuted in last week's episode. For those who are uninitiated, in this little firecracker of a segment, I highlight notable tech-related fails or otherwise stupid moves that need to get some attention. This segment is meant to be fun, and if you like fun, you should probably gently and with tender loving care press that little like button down below, but don't smash it, lightly press it. Like buttons deserve humane treatment, just like the subscribe button, so don't smash that bad boy. The first fail I'd like to address is somewhat of a whale of a fail, and that is a tongue twister. This popular video calling app you might have heard of called Zoom has had a recent slew of privacy and security issues in the wake of COVID-19. Recently, CNET.com compiled a list of all the issues Zoom has faced over the last month or so and the dates that these things have occurred, and it's shocking scrolling through all that stuff how poorly everything has been handled from call records and data being exposed on the web to personal meeting IDs being used to peep in on private calls to global calls being routed through Chinese servers, Zoom has found a way to take what could have been the moment that they took over the market and turned it into a PR disaster. Why wait until the world is watching and needs you to find all these clear security and privacy flaws in your service? How can you miss these fundamentals? Look, I get that stuff happens. Software is never perfect. I know that. Anyone who works in software knows that. But some of these things are just fundamental things that cannot happen. 404, logic not found, sip of coffee. Crazy stuff, guys. Crazy stuff. I am not definitely going to quit Zoom, but I'm looking at alternatives, and I'll be making a video about that very shortly. Now, moving back into the world of crypto, the main R&D arm behind EOS or EOS, whatever you want to call it, that parent company Block One has announced that it will begin voting for block producers with their large EOS token holdings on the public network. Block One, who built the core backend tech behind the EOS blockchain, are the largest single ownership entity of EOS tokens with 9.5% of the total token supply in their possession. This move is surely in response to the simple fact that exchanges have been leveraging their customers' EOS tokens to vote for block producers. How? Which essentially means that these exchanges who technically own the lion's share of tokens around the world control the network as a cartel, as oligarchs. It's crazy. 
clearly this is far from a decentralized network at this point, and that's the main complaint people have about EOS. Their tech is quality, their code is quality, the governance sucks. Now I wonder why Block One is making this move. No, I don't, I know exactly why they're doing it. They're trying to fix the situation and their motive is honorable. But in my opinion, this is the completely wrong way of going about it. Block One is now a centralized, powerful entity who's coming in to rescue and throw their weight around to influence the network in the right direction. This might quell the concerns about exchanges themselves controlling the network, but it doesn't actually solve the problem. And that's that EOS governance, the model, is broken. Coming in as a big centralized entity to clean up a mess, even for the right reasons, is a paradox. Fighting centralization with centralization ignores the real issue at hand, and that's that the governance model that they have does not inherently disincentivize and prevent cartels from forming within the ecosystem itself. 404, logic not found, this makes no sense. Hopefully this gets resolved because I actually do like EOS in a lot of ways. And that, my friends, leads me to our next news story, which is the sad story of the Bitcoin Cash halving. Recently, the Bitcoin Cash blockchain, a fork of Bitcoin, mind you, underwent a block reward halving from 12.5 to 6.25 BCH, or Bitcoin Cash, per block for miners on the network. At current prices right now, here we are on April 10th, this is worth around 1500 bucks per block reward. I did a really detailed video on halvings and what it means and how it all works, and I'll link that up here and down below if you're curious. You can pause this video and check that out. But one of the critical values of a halving is that it reduces the rate of inflation for a fixed supply asset. It makes the asset more scarce as miners must work just as hard to earn half as much, and that really helps drive value. However, this is a critical part of not only the valuation of the coin, but more importantly, the security of the network relies on miners themselves. So it's normal for miners to evacuate the chain as profitability takes a hit after a halving, but it's critical that the hash rate, the total hash rate on the network doesn't drop too quickly and that enough hash power remains to prevent things like 51% attacks and chain freezes. See, if miners leave en masse all at once, the chain can freeze. Blocks don't get mined because there's not enough computing power to mine a block until the difficulty of obtaining proof of work readjusts to this new low hash rate. This exact thing happened in Bitcoin Cash. The miners left en masse, the chain froze, and it took two hours to mine a block after the halving. This was no small drop in hash rate either. It's reported that Bitcoin Cash lost nearly 80% of the hash power on the network as a result of the halving. This poses a huge security risk to the network. As the cost of a 51% attack, where a coordinated attack on the network occurs by gathering 51% or more of the total hash power on the network, is now dangerously cheap to execute. It's estimated that for a mere $10,000, maybe $15,000 of cloud computing resources, a 51% attack on the Bitcoin Cash network could happen and disrupt the network. This type of cheap attack would not necessarily mean the end of Bitcoin Cash, but it would be quite problematic in the eyes of users who trust the network now with their transactions and coins. Ethereum Classic got a 51% attack and it took a while to earn trust back from their people. Could this happen to Bitcoin though, that's coming up on a halving in May? And the answer is yes, it's possible, but the scale is something that you need to consider here. Currently a 51% attack on Bitcoin that would do potentially irreparable damage, like things you can't fix, it would cost upwards of a billion dollars or more to execute. And even for a short one hour attack with minimal consequences, it could cost upwards of $600,000 just to execute an attack on Bitcoin. Even with a mass exodus of hash rate post halving, it would be much costlier to attack the Bitcoin network due to its much larger pool of resources and much larger pool of miners for that matter. Nothing is unhackable, but risk versus reward versus cost matters a lot too. The incentive for hackers to go about it versus what it would cost for them to execute that attack. Even if you execute a $600,000 attack, all you're gonna do is disrupt the network. You're not gonna steal a whole lot. So it's not worth it. Speaking of Bitcoin though, and continuing that thread, I saw some data about the Bitcoin halving and its relationship to how Bitcoin is held by big and small investors alike. Notably in 2016, prior to the halving, the number of whales, whales holding 1,000 or more Bitcoins hovered right around 2,000 individuals or 2,000 organizations, who knows? But that number 
is eerily similar to the numbers being reported today. So in 2016, the number of whales holding 1,000 or more is about the same as it is right now, right before the halving. So could this mean that the whales that were present in 2016 for that nice ride all the way to all-time highs in 2017 are getting ready for the same price action this coming year and a half? Maybe. Although what I think is even more interesting is that the number of individual wallets, like normal people, like us, that own one or more Bitcoin has increased dramatically this time around. This indicates that an ever-growing awareness of Bitcoin is, is there, and heavier investment is coming from smaller investors. Now, I'm curious. Let me know in the comments down below or up in this YouTube card poll thing up above what you think about the Bitcoin having and what it will do to its price. Is Bitcoin BTC going up? Is it going down? Is it going sideways or what? You like those hand gestures there. I'm kind of amped from this coffee. Now, staying in the world of Bitcoin, the Canadian asset management firm 3IQ launched a new fund on the Toronto Stock Exchange, the TSX, that's tied to Bitcoin. This comes as a real surprise to me that regulators approved such a fund, especially during these times right now economically. As you may well know, a Bitcoin ETF or exchange traded fund has been fought hard and fast within the regulatory field here in the US. So I'm shocked, like truly shocked, that a Bitcoin backed fund launched with what seems to be minimal hoopla in Canada. It is reported that 3IQ had negotiated for this whole thing for three years three years to bring this to market. So clearly a lot went on behind the scenes that we didn't know about. And that, that just reminds me of an episode of SpongeBob. The quote goes, way to go, buddy. It took us three days to make that potato salad. Three days. If you know that episode, comment the episode name down below and I'll pick one random person who gets it right and send them some Bitcoin. I'm a grown man. I love cartoons. I guess I'm just a kid at heart. So I love to play these little giveaway games on the channel. Anyway, this news is far more impactful than I think people realize. Canada is very similar to the USA, and if they can get a Bitcoin-backed fund passed, that bodes well for us here. Tyler Winklevoss, one of the main champions for the Bitcoin ETF here in the USA, agrees with this sentiment, having praised the 3IQ fund as the first public Bitcoin fund listed on a major stock exchange, and that is a direct quote. Interestingly enough, the Bitcoin custody services for the fund are provided by Tyler and his twin brother, and their crypto exchange, Gemini. I'm very hopeful that with the next changing of the guard, if you will, within the SEC, that we will see a Bitcoin ETF here in the USA. And all I have to say is, well done, Canada. Well done. Peep the Molson Canadian sign. I'm actually not Canadian. I'm from America. But, you know, the sign's confusing. I do also want to briefly mention Cardano here, though, because there was some notable news to report on that front that I think you should know about. The commercial incubator slash research and development arm of Cardano called Emergo recently announced and launched a Cardano-based supply chain solution that will allow the scanning and tracking of goods from entity to entity and the end customer to allow the end customer to identify the exact provenance of the goods that they are buying. Now, the first user of this new solution is Blue Karinji Coffee, who are going to be using this Cardano solution to provide customers more traceability into the origin of their coffee. Coffee being the theme of this show, I think it's important to note that I love coffee, and it is really hard to know where your coffee's coming from unless you trust the vendor you're buying from. So, this is something I can get behind. This series is predicated on delicious coffee, so well done. Heck, Blue Karinji Coffee, please, if you're watching this, sponsor the channel. I'd love to get some free coffee and hang out and talk about Blue Karinji Coffee in every episode. So I'm very stoked to see Emergo pushing the envelope on enterprise-oriented use of the tech behind Cardano, and I hope that continues because I think enterprise tech has an appetite for more options besides the ones that are out there today. Ethereum for enterprise, Hyperledger for enterprise. There's really not a lot of competition out there. So Cardano can really throw their weight into this and create an enterprise solution that could take some market share. Now, staying in the world of supply chain, as you all are probably fully aware, we are all entrenched in the throes of COVID-19 and the subsequent quarantine as such. We've all been instructed now to wear masks when going out of our homes in the USA, and I know abroad there are a lot of the same regulations happening in other countries. Of course, this proves to be a little bit problematic because there are hardly enough masks of the specific N95 variety, of course, to give to healthcare workers. 
let alone for every man, woman, and child to have one for themselves to wear while they go out and get a bag of potatoes at Giant. This has spurred the FDA within the US to finally, finally approve the use of Chinese-made masks called KN95, which are largely the same, just maybe slightly different in design. This will allow them to supplement our supply of masks here in the USA. Better late than never, I suppose. That said, the concerns about legitimacy and the ever-present threat of counterfeit masks has reared its ugly head in result. It is likely, if not guaranteed, that fake, ineffective KN95 knockoffs will crop up on eBay and all the reseller markets alike. That said, Real Items Company, yes, that is a company, who use VeChain's technology to track the provenance and legitimacy of goods, have stepped in to solve this problem. Using VeChain Network's NFR spec, or non-fungible record spec, the Real Items Company is looking to tag legitimate KN95 producers' masks with a QR code or some other identifier that pertains to a non-fungible record on the VeChain blockchain and interplanetary file storage. This record can then be used as a means to validate that one is getting a legit mask. So theoretically, you'd be able to scan the mask that you get or the package that you get and it would be able to tell you, did this come from a legitimate seller? This is a great idea. This is a viable use case. And I think that VeChain is killing it in the supply chain world as it relates to blockchain. And I apologize that in the, I guess two videos ago, someone asked about supply chain and what projects are great. I didn't mention VeChain because my brain forgets about things at times like any other human being. So I'm, my apologies there, but VeChain is great. And hey, if you're interested in the use cases like blockchain for supply chain or other enterprise things like that, you need to understand this one critical concept called hashing. So check out this video here on the screen. I'll link it up, I think over here to get a simple, easy to understand explanation so you can get up to speed on all that. Thanks in advance and until next time, cheers.